Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Midnight Strike Through Mormons. I am your host, Cardinal Ellis, and today I am joined in the studio by Kwaku L, and also I botched that, but Brad Whitbeck and Jacob Hansen, as well as via Zoom and the interwebs. Jacob Isbell is back in studio, and apparently, I guess today we're talking about, um, what are we talking about, Kwaku? What do you introduce the topic? We're talking about Brigham Young. Because as Latter-day Saints, Brigham Young is the second prophet of our church. But with this new independent Mormon movement springing, they, for the most part, don't like Brigham Young. So now, the two worlds are combining once again. We have a bouncer here to make sure that Brad and Jacob don't fist fight, even though they're uh, two states away. And uh, we're just going to discuss this because it's it's such a relevant topic right now. We may as well. OK. And then so Jacob is going to be playing the role of the person arguing against Brigham Young. Do we need a translator? I don't speak wolf and he's wearing sheep's clothing. Oh, but uh, no, I just I thought that one up right now. And I'm sorry, but you wore that jacket to this event. So you you got that one. OK, so uh, sure. Then then who wants to start us off? Jacob, uh, Jacob, start us off. Where do we go from here? Which Jacob? Now remember, you've Isabel, got more. Than, sorry, Isabel. You've got yeah. more than one of them here. You're gonna throw <laughs> me floor, for a loop trying to keep 22 minutes. The floor is yours. Why don't you think Brigham Young was a prophet? Hit it, go. Go, go ahead and share my screen if you will. I'm gonna click the button that says share screen. Boom. Let's go ahead and do it. I, for okay. one, liked Brigham Young a whole lot. He would be welcome at any barbecue of mine. I hit the thing that says, let's say. Oh, you disabled my ability to share my screen. No, I, just just haven't, a, I haven't enabled it yet, so let me try and do that right now. You really try fast. to do this. You're going to do post-production editing. It's one of, okay, share screen, multiple participants simultaneously. Okay, I believe now you what should you be able to do it. Share screen. Let's go ahead and do my desktop number two. So there are those who dislike Brigham Young. I'm not one of those. I like Brigham Young a whole lot. I think he'd be fun at a barbecue. Okay. But probably the greatest case to where um, Brigham Young is rejected comes from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The doctrinal innovations of Brigham Young have been soundly rejected. And if anybody here were to preach in an LDS congregation, the doctrines taught from the pulpit by Brigham Young for more than three full decades, they would be brought before a disciplinary council. And if they did not denounce the things that they claim they believe because they were taught for decades by Brigham Young, they would be removed from the church. Just a few of the highlights from Brigham Young taught as if they are commandments from the Lord and the will of Jesus Christ. Blacks are to be denied the priesthood. The penalty for intermixing with somebody who was black is death. Polygamy is a requirement for salvation. The church has fully rejected that. Adam equals God is fully rejected. And uh, Bruce R. McConkie certainly has some fun exchanges in denouncing that, as well as Spencer W. Kimball. Things like blood atonement to where certain sins require the murder of said individual, and that is said to be a doctrine of Jesus Christ. Because the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints rejects the doctrines of Brigham Young, they show that they don't want anything to do with what he teaches. Uh, well, I wouldn't go so far as to say they don't want anything to do with what he teaches, but yeah. I think there's... Like, specific folklore that's been renounced yes well anyway sorry but this isn't my argument I, i'm saying keep going who else has something to yeah, say go, go ahead I, I mean that i don't think that represents the sum total of what brigham young taught but let's just stick with those ones <laughs> well okay did, oh, those no, I, I, from Jesus Christ. did did brigham young bring to the table uh false ideas sure and i would i i like Okay, there are ideas that he brought to the table that the church no longer endorses that, that were his own. But Why doesn't the church doesn't, endorse it? That doesn't, that doesn't mean that he was not called of God to do what why, he did. Why doesn't the church endorse those teachings? Don't they come from Jesus Christ? Well, no. You, no, 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 hold on a second. <laughs> okay, so I, I, I now I see where we're doing this, is where we're going. Um, I kind of feel like this tack in argument is a little bit like when the anti-Mormons try and dude, say dude, 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 stop doing that. Let's go with what Brigham Young taught. No, no, I, I get it. Let's well, stick with what Brigham Young taught. Yeah. Well, uh, Don't I, I, go I, I, down side roads. No, I'm not. I'm not I think he's just contextualizing. Here. I, I'm contextualizing this. I'm saying, yes, back when Brigham Young was the governor of Wait, the So it Utah, sounds like we're in agreement that these teachings are false. Well, it, let me get to the end of my sentence. Yes, they're false. But this is also, these are quotes that are coming from first and second hand sources back when the governor no. was also the prophet. No, that's and false. And it's a little bit difficult to distinguish 
between First, when somebody was trying to say this something was published during the lifetime of Brigham Young. We can read his words for ourselves. Yes. OK, I get that. But of the three million words that he printed, if we mm-hmm. only just take the seven more. And these are the ones that I chose to focus on because these are his doctrinal innovations. The mm-hmm. things taught from the pulpit as if they I come from Jesus doc- Christ, oh, there's so as many if they others. come from Jesus Christ, this is taught for more than three decades. That's as if it's commandments like from God. Saying, that's literally like saying Freddie Mercury's only musical innovation okay. Where's his so, so in other songs. words, why does the Church of Jesus Christ reject what the president of the church teaches? Okay, okay, why does that, wait, repeat that question? Why does the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints reject what is taught by President Brigham Young? Because we also reject what, for example, Jonah did when he fleed from, the, from God and disobeyed God and ultimately ended up having to get f- fed into the belly of a beast for three days. Like, uh, it, prophets screw up when they adopt popular principles and don't be a peculiar people. So, so in order to get this us not to run in circles, I think where this is headed is this. How do we define what a prophet is? Can a prophet still be a prophet and have doctrinal errors regarding yes. the nature of God or gods? And if so, what is the precedent set in scripture well, for that? Before we, go to, or, before we go to what is a prophet, I, I want this one to be fleshed out a little bit. Is there anybody here on the podcast right now? Imagine if, if if you were alive in the days of Brigham Young, a member of the church trying to be as faithful to Jesus Christ as possible, is there anyone here who would have publicly said, Brigham, that is not from the Lord, and you yeah, need to renounce his name? It. Orson I'm, Pratt was I'm one of them, say, and he was Pratt, disciplined for many, it. Many of the those doctrinal innovations within the church, to some extent, like especially the idea of Adam being God, was a very controversial thing yeah. at the time. And there was so why did the Quorum of the Twelve, so, so why did the Quorum of the Twelve days of Brigham go along with it? Real quick, real quick. So if, in fact, one of the ways that doctrine is established, so far as I understand it, within the church, is that it is established within unanimity within the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles yeah. and the First Presidency of the Church. It seems very clear, at least on the Adam-God question, that there wasn't unanimity. And Christ I mean, has said, if ye are not one, ye are not mine. And well, so that's if, the method if that's I used a, by the church. If, well, I, have, well, if well, I have a rogue, uh, you know, teaching from Brigham or from someone else, I have the collective witness of the other living prophets, the scriptures, and all of these other things by which I can check the words of a given prophet and say, you know what? I think that there's a better case that Brigham was wrong on these because of scriptural precedent and because of uh, the fact that there wasn't unanimity within the Quorum of the Twelve. And I'm speaking specifically to the Adam-God question, okay? I do not believe, even in the time of Brigham Young, that the, well, the scriptures haven't changed, so that the scriptures have never supported the idea that Adam was God. The apostles at the time of Brigham Young didn't support the idea that Adam was God. And so I, as a member trying to be as faithful as I could at that time, I would have said, I'm sorry, Brigham Young, based on my heuristic that I bring to the table here, I don't have a collective witness of all of God's prophets to support that notion. Um, also, the only thing I would add to that, Jacob Isbell, I have to use your guys' last name, so I sound like a mother <laughs> who's constantly angry. Jacob Hanson, Jacob Isbell. I would say, um, what's your response to my answer to your question? Like, we don't endorse prophets wholesale rejecting God and running away, yet Jonah did it. We hold him up as an example of prophetic fallibility. So there's your answer right there. Like Catholics are the only church that say their prophet is infallible and nobody believes it. Mormons are the only people who say their prophet is fallible and nobody believes it. There's (laughs) cultural complexity here, but there's your answer right there. We have scriptural precedent for a prophet having made an error, having to repent, and then moving forward, which... Fortunately for me, makes think makes me think if I personally err, I can repent and move forward. Brigham Young there, erred in these four controversial areas. The church has repented and moved forward. Well, what, what's the example that the church has repented? The I just watched the in the ATC talk that um, who is that uh, black elder that talked about Corbett, activism against the church? Corbett. Yeah, Elder yeah. Corbett. He specifically said the church has. Um, uh, eliminated and repented of folklore about African Americans, uh, about the nature of God. I mean, he specifically named like almost two or three of the uh, 
the things you had on your screen there just in one sentence. Who, who, who are you referring to? Elder, Elder Corbett. Corbett in his recent talk on. I, I have no clue. Church. I have no clue who that is. Uh, he's in the Young Men's General. Is it Young Men's young General? Young Men's President? General President. Yeah, he, he, he has he authority was, to apologize on behalf of the Church of Jesus Christ. He he wasn't apologizing in it. He was explaining that the church has repented of these things. So what's the evidence that the church has repented? What the evidence are we, you looking the fact, for? The fact, <laughs> the, I, I would say the fact that, as you had mentioned earlier, that we all would get excommunicated from the church if we continued to preach well, no, but also they, those they wrote doctrines. That, they wrote, there's been ad nauseum <laughs> talks about how this is wrong. There has been those gospel topic essays where they say, look, the origins of this are unclear, but we denounce it. Like, I, I, they didn't write produced, you a formal apology letter, but I mean, yeah. I feel like in the zeitgeist of is this correct, there is, I mean, Russell M. Nelson, for heaven's sakes, is taking pictures, hugging the NAACP guy. They're, the crap, they're besties now, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and he's getting it from the pulpit in conference, you know, saying Black Lives Matter. Like, I, I, just, I, don't, I, I don't know <laughs> what more can, like, what so, more can we do? Like, I mean... Let's let's go to the topic of prophets. What do you mean when you call somebody a prophet? Can we clearly define what that means? So can I can I try and offer an explanation on that? So it, there are different ways in which you could talk about a person being a prophet. We can use little p prophet. Like I could be a prophet for my own family, right? Uh, I, I could be a, if the bishop, you know, he could be the little p prophet for his own ward. The, there's a famous scripture that you know that all of Israel would be would be prophets, right? So that's the little p conception of a prophet. It is one who receives prophecy from the Lord or revelation from the Lord for a particular student. Like Freddie Mercury. I'm just I'm just putting it in there. Okay. So anyway, keep going. And then you have a capital P prophet, which we refer to in the church as the president of the church. This is the person who holds the keys of stewardship over the entire earth. He is the one who is entitled to receive revelation and general guidance from the Lord for the whole earth. That's the way I would frame it. Okay. Um, sure. Brad, you do, you, do you consider does it, those that are on this podcast, who considers President Nelson and Brigham Young a prophet of God the same way that Lehi, Jeremiah, and Isaiah are prophets of God? Me. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I, the short I, answer is me, but I also recognize that, like, go through the New Testament, like, some of the apostles were a lot more BA than the others. Like, yeah. I, I feel like Simon Peter has a much bigger house in heaven. No, I'm just kidding. I won't say that. But like, you know, <laughs> oh I'd say gosh. I'd say Simon Peter is 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 a lot bigger of an A and apostle than, for example, the kind of no name what Simon the Zealot that only has like two verses and, yeah. <laughs> and, and we don't know. So I think it's like yes, I I, I say Russell M. Nelson. Um, I think it was very visionary what he did choosing to go to come follow me. And I also think that it is much more groundbreaking than we understand his push towards away from identitarianism, saying that our primary identity is a child of God, second, a children, a child of the covenant, third, a disciple of Christ. And, and those things are just as powerful in my mind as perhaps, you know, Harold B. Lee saying every member a missionary and things like that. Do I think Russell M. Nelson has had as much of an impact on the world as, I don't know, Simon Peter, when he saw the sheet come down and was told that you are now not just preaching to the Jews, you're preaching to the Greeks? Okay, so maybe he's not up there with, the, the you know, Simon Peter in the book of Acts, but does he hold those same keys, that same responsibility, and have access to the same prophetic revelation? I would say emphatically yes to that. Yeah. Yeah, let me uh, make the case for a disagreement right here. I'm just referring to examples from the scriptures. Um, Lehi was called as a prophet by his direct communication with God. His son, his son Nephi, didn't rely upon the testimony of his father, but he obtained direct communication with God for himself. Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 1 testifies of his direct communication with God, called into God's presence. Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6, he's called into the presence of God, receives his call that way, even when you have somebody like Samuel the Lamanite, Jesus Christ himself backs him up and says, I told Samuel, whatever pops into your heart, you say it, and I will back you up. And that happened. In the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the one and only criteria is the ability to outlive those with more seniority. There's no spiritual gifts. There's no witness of President Nelson or Brigham Young ever once being called into the presence of God, like the scriptures we read about. 
Um, if you have any examples of, of him being called in the presence of God, Brad and, and yeah. Jake, yeah, I, I would love it. it. My, I would my, love it. something that's akin to either Joseph Smith or Isaiah or Jeremiah. What would be oh, the okay, closest? Well, well, just hold on one second. I, I have one response to that that I'd like to get out that just is the first thing that popped in my head, and then you guys can just go to town. Um, this is a consistent thing I've seen on YouTube videos from, uh, gosh, it's so fragmented. Some people don't want to be called the doctrine of Christ. Some people do. Some people want to be called the remnant. Keep going. But I, I guess whatever you want to call your movement being right now, um, I've seen this on a lot of YouTube videos of people from the movement and stuff um, saying, yeah, okay, you have to be called of God and there has to be that big powerful witness. But simultaneously, you guys believe the Book of Mormon still to be the word of God, correct? Of course. Okay, well, there's a lot of those weird minor prophets like in the Book of Omni, you know what I'm saying? Where like, Why would Omni be a prophet? Well, well, because even, well, let, me just, let me flesh this out a little bit. There's a few different authors that are inside of the Book of Mormon, even inside of the Bible, that are quite clear. They've never claimed any interaction with God, yet they have writings that are meaningful. When I use the word a prophet of God, I'm referring specifically to somebody called into the presence of God and testifies of okay, it. Okay, so that's, well, but, that's but hold I on. Would, but with I, Jonah, just because you had a personal yeah, revelation, well, we're told the story of Jonah, thought, well, Jonah refers to. Here's all I know of Jonah. Jonah testifies of, me, of hearing the voice of the Lord and rejecting a call until things got so bad that he repented. I now, that's, that's a very different caliber than Isaiah and Jeremiah. Okay, I, I, think, I think we're parsing into, into just arbitrary definitions that we're creating for, yeah, for profit. Yeah, because I'm trying when to keep I, it as ultimately, distinct as possible. I'm trying to, let, me, let me just repeat mine real quick, just so I'm really clear. When I say someone is a prophet of God, I'm referring to somebody who has exercised faith to be called into the presence of God and receive their prophetic call directly from him, not just outlive people in a corporation. Okay, excellent. So, so, so let, me, let me real quickly frame this. Okay, Whether or not a person has been called directly into the actual presence of God is an arbitrary standard for prophethood from my perspective. What I care about well, they, is who is the person on earth who has the stewardship to receive general revelation for the whole world. That's the well, functional definition like of a prophet that ultimately matters to me. I, Can we explore if, that? If, hold on, I want to explore if, that avenue. If, if Brad went and, and was brought into the presence of the Lord and had this amazing experience with God, that doesn't necessarily grant him authority over the whole world to grant revelation to me. And, and yeah. if he hasn't, ever been called into the presence of God. I get your point, but I want to follow that path. Uh, Jacob Hansen, I really like the path that you're laying out right there. Uh, so let's just explore President Nelson, if he is a prophet of God today. The policies that he implements, I think of the doctrinal innovations of Brigham Young, we already talked about that. What about the policies of President Nelson? Is it from Jesus Christ, global lockdowns? Is it from Jesus Christ, mass mandates? Is it from Jesus Christ that President Nelson declares all churches will be shut down? Is that from Jesus Christ? I would say uh, I do not believe in prophetic infallibility. And so, so no, do I, I, I believe, hear, do I, wait, 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 hold on. I want to hear if that's from Jesus Christ. I have, if I want I to hear it, I don't hey, know. Guys, it guys, guys, guys. Hey, Jacob so, Isbell, you'll be allowed to talk. Don't worry. You don't, you don't have to interrupt. But, but, but this tap dancing to other things, I just, I don't want to be talking to no, Kareem, no. Kareem Jean-Pierre. I want to no, hear we're something. Not, we're not tap dancing. I, I, I answered your question about Omni and stuff, and also... I also believe one big piece of context. Well, yeah, okay, those, just, those policies yeah. are Everybody those policies... shut up for speak. a second, okay? You'll all be allowed to speak, okay? Just give us a second here, okay? Jeez, it's bad radio when I got four people talking at once. <laughs> okay? <laughs> now, the pool so we can get your ratings up. <laughs> uh, okay. So, so here's the deal. I think it's fair if Jacob Hansen criticizes your definition as arbitrary... That okay. prophets Even must be called. That they must be called with this great spiritual experience because I, I think there's plenty that haven't. For example, you know they cast lots to replace the apostles, and you know just because every apostle didn't have the apostle Paul experience on the road to Damascus, doesn't mean like that their book of James isn't as important as the. Um, the, the epistle to the Hebrews. I think it's valid of you to say, hey, I want to see spiritual fruits and gifts, and I will call into question much of the policies surrounding the jab and things like that, and I feel yeah. sometimes the defenses thereof saying, oh, well, it was a press release, not a revelation, are, are pretty weak sauce. I also personally... Where do you fall? Uh, yeah, I, I also personally don't like the seniority-based leadership model. I call that into question, and I think... Okay, is that as good as past leadership models that we have had in the past, where there was younger apostles as well as older apostles? I, I think those are all good arguments to have, but I don't think there's summary disqualifications. Well, I, I want to hear. 
because I'm, I'm hearing a lot of whether we like it, whether it's good. Who, who cares what my opinion is or anybody else's? Okay. Did the policies implemented by Russell M. Nelson come from Jesus Christ or not? Okay, so the, the, this is the big thing we've not even touched on, which is kind of important. One, when we think about the scriptures, we are reading them in hindsight. In hindsight's 2020, we don't necessarily know if Omni or Jonah were brought into the presence of God because they weren't editing the book. Yeah. And so even to this day, maybe in a hundred years, we're going to have some diary entry from Harold B. Lee. And it was like, can you believe it? I was in Springville and I was caught up in the presence of God on Cobble Creek Canyon. And that will make it in. But some of these visions, some of those beautiful visions we have through scripture, we don't have until hundreds of years after. Even the beginning of the church, Joseph Smith's first vision wasn't something that was spoken about every time that they started teaching people. So yeah, I do think we're kind of walking on cobblestones on a, on yeah, a lake. Yeah. Well, yeah. I want to go back to what comes from Jesus Christ in the church and what doesn't, because we have right. some, we have got global policies implemented by President Nelson. Yes. So, Is there anybody here that's willing to say those came from Jesus Christ? So, so real quick. I'm, I, well, I, I, I just, I tried, I'm trying three credits. times for that question. I, I know, and I'll, and let me answer it, okay? Okay, let's assume that they didn't come from Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Let's assume that they were his best attempt at navigating the situation according to his own judgment. Well, that doesn't negate the fact that he still could be a prophet of God, because li- li- I, I have a stewardship over my own family. Who do you and think gives them those policies? And sometimes I do my best within my stewardship to guide my own family. Okay, and sometimes I do believe that the Lord has helped me and guided me in the right things. But I think sometimes God lets us go and make our own decisions. Joseph Smith was a prophet, yet um, did the policy to create the Kirkland Safety Society did that come from Jesus? Because if that if that didn't come from Jesus by your standard, it would seem that we need to reject Joseph Smith. And in fact, no. a huge amount no. of people did because of the Kirkland Safety Society. So my thing is, is that you're setting up a standard that's so high. That even yeah, that's certainly not what you're describing is not my standard. Uh, well, it just doesn't seem to be applied yeah. equally, I think, is yeah. what Jacob said. Yeah, and see, and I'm a big boy and I can speak for myself. But when you try to say what my standards are, I know that it's been it's been unfair to you guys as I've seen others do that to you. OK, well, so so here actually, that's an interesting question. Like, I, I, I like how you if, say, if those policies didn't come from Jesus Christ. Where did President Nelson get those policies? If the policies for the Kirkland Safety Society didn't come from Jesus Christ. Then. Then yeah. where did they come from? Well, where, where, where do you fall on that? I fall on the fact that I think that Joseph was doing his best to keep. The let me let me, let me point out something regarding. Well, let, let me just point out some things that we can observe right now. Um, I'm thinking of right now because I reread earlier today, First Nephi chapters 13 and 14, where Nephi sees the formation of a great oh, okay, and abominable. Wait, wait a second, but before we move on, Jacob, I, I don't. Oh, yeah? I want to make sure we put one topic to rest before we just yeah. shotgun into another one. Well, this is, and I'm finding this directly related. I know there's a little bit of lead up and I can be succinct, but I'm not wandering off on different paths. Uh, okay, but I, I do I do want, I, I want to hear your answer to this question. I think it's fair to say, okay, well, if prophets are making this claim in the LDS church, they speak with God, did these policies that I think most of us would agree were either excessive or intergenerationally biased or whatever, did those come from Jesus? And many of us, including myself, would feel uncomfortable with that idea, okay? However, let's take that rubric. If you're using that to effectively disqualify Russell M. Nelson, which is the insinuation, if we were to apply that to the prophet that you believe was the prophet, we mutually believe was the prophet, Joseph Smith, and said, well, where did the inspiration for the Kirkland Safety Society come? If we're saying, hey, human, if we're saying human error exists and Russell M. Nelson, despite the greatest of his faculties, uh, made a mistake and you can't accept that. Yeah. Well, let me, let me point out theory. some agreement. We, I believe all of us are in agreement that hu- that humans, even prophets, are definitely fallible. But when I evaluate the global policies okay. of Russell and Nelson, they are in lockstep with the global policies being promoted as we speak at the World Economic Forum by Klaus Schwab, Bill Gates, and others. I recognize that specifically what we've been warned about in First Nephi chapters 13 and 14. Not only did those policies not come from Jesus Christ, they are specifically something we've been so warned it, against it and we are commanded to wake up to. It seems to me that the your connection with Russell M. Nelson to kind of the global new world order that you yeah, see... by his fruits, is, I know him. Is the, okay, so if I were to go by the fruits of, for instance, someone like Brigham Young, 
versus the other offshoot branches that have existed within the church. That's the number one reason. I don't have a testimony of Brigham Young because of his theological innovations. I have a testimony of Brigham Young because of what he created, which is one of the mm-hmm. most fascinating stories. I don't care if you're even not even a believer in the church. What Brigham Young did was yeah. incredible. And He's an impressive I man. Believe, and I believe it wasn't because he was just an impressive man. I believe because the Lord was with him. And there were all sorts of people trying to offshoot from Brigham Young, and they all failed. And if they had the Lord with them, and Brigham was the one who was in the wrong, why didn't the Lord guide some other group? Now, it seems very clear to me yeah, that the Lord was with Brigham Young by the fruit now, that Jake, came out of it. And, in and Jacob Isbell's defense, one could say, um, see, I, I'm, I'm not all against you, Jacob. But like one could say that, well, that's just the winners telling the history. That Brigham Young was just the most effective of all the offshoots, maybe a better mountain man, maybe a better city planner. And just because we ended up becoming the greatest, I, I don't necessarily believe this, but I could see why a detractor might say, because we ended up being the most successful of the succession crisis, we get to write the history books saying <laughs> we had God with well, us, well, right? No, I, but I would say, to that I would say, go study the history. <laughs> it's 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 a damn miracle. Okay? Yeah. It is one of the most fascinating stories and it is it is a large part of the reason that I am a Latter-day Saint is because of that history and what came out of it is something it is the most beautiful and prosperous both gospel and people that the world has ever produced okay. in my opinion. We get that. Let's let Jacob talk. Jacob Continue. What, what, some of the things that I'm wondering, why didn't Brigham Young continue with the plan that was laid out by the Lord in the Doctrine of Covenants for the redemption of Zion? Okay. Gathering all of the Lord's people to one place. Why was that model abandoned when it's our scriptures? Okay. You see, you're, you're asking if I understand. I want to understand your question correctly because yeah. you may Whoever understand. wants to answer that. In other words, the Doctrine of Covenants is clear as can be that the gathering of his Nauvoo was to be a permanent stake of Zion. Um, Jackson County, Missouri is to be redeemed as well. And if the saints were faithful, they would never be removed out of their place, but they were preparing for the second coming. Why was that model in our scriptures abandoned by Brigham Young? For the same reason that it was abandoned in Kirtland. They were commanded to abandon in Kirtland, but then persecution pushed them out. And so they had to... Uh, yeah, re- the Lord gave a very different promise. Just share my screen, Just and I promise to be super duper quick yeah, right sure. here. No, it's fine. Oh, yeah, by the share. way, you, you could... Uh, oh, oh, I'm going to hit the. Oh, I'm going to hit the thing that says, that share screen because there's yeah. specific things in our scriptures. Here's how we would know if we're being duped or not, uh-huh. is because we'll be able to we'll be able to see for ourselves what it is that the scriptures teach. I'm going over right now to Doctrine and Covenants section 124. Now there had been what seems to be like a huge dearth of no revelations for quite some time as they are in Nauvoo, and the Lord's given the Latter Day Saints one last chance to be able to get things right before. Before here's what's about to happen. And I'm just going over to verse 28 right here. I'm going to be really quick. 28 and verse 32. You can read the whole thing for yourself. The Lord is telling the Latter-day Saints, there is not a place found on the earth that he, the Lord, may come to restore again that which was lost unto you, or which he, the Lord, hath taken away, even the fullness of the priesthood. I'm skipping to verse 32. At the end of this appointment, if you don't finish the Nauvoo temple and the Nauvoo house, your baptisms for your dead shall not be acceptable unto me, saith the Lord. And if you do not these things at the end of the appointment, ye shall be rejected as a church with your dead, saith the Lord your God. Let me give one more verse. Okay. And the Lord promises them that if they're faithful to all these things, they shall not be moved out of their place. So the rewriting of history to say persecution kicked them out, the Lord already told them, if you're faithful, you will never be kicked out. Um. You guys feel free to respond, but I'm just going to say what my first thought was. I'm not the theologian as I'm not as big brained as everybody else here, but I, I think the only the only thought that came to my mind was this sounds very similar to a lot of the promises that were made to the Jews as they were wandering in Israel under the tutelage of Moses. But because they were so bad and they kept on making golden calves and collecting manna when they should and all the what whatever, you know, problems that they had Moses hitting smiting the rock when he shouldn't have. Um, that a lot of those promises were taken away, but then were res- restored and then were given again 
but they didn't live yeah. up to and they took away. And that's ultimately why they did spend those four. You're right on. Carden, you're right on. Let me just share one more thing. And I promise I'm done after this. I'm just going to click to share my screen one more time. <laughs> okay. You described right there of the Latter-day Saints repeating what happened to the children of Israel. Oh, I got it. Yeah. yeah. Exactly what our scriptures teach. <laughs> you're going to notice that when it says Moses, I'm going to insert Joseph Smith so people can consider this. And when I when I say the children of Israel, I'm going to insert the Latter-day Saints. So you know the connections that I'm making. This is section 84, verses 23 through 26. Now, this Moses and Joseph Smith plainly taught their people, the children of Israel and the Latter-day Saints, in the wilderness and sought diligently to sanctify their people that they might behold the face of God. But they, the children of Israel anciently and the Latter-day Saints in Joseph Smith's day, hardened their hearts and could not endure the Lord's presence. Therefore, the Lord, in his wrath, for his anger was kindled against them, swore that they, ancient Israel and modern-day Latter-day Saints, should not enter into his rest while in the wilderness, which rest is the fullness of glory. Therefore, the Lord took Moses out of ancient Israel's midst and Joseph Smith out of the Latter-day Saints midst, and the holy priesthood he took away also, and the lesser priesthood continued, which priesthood holdeth the keys of the ministering of angels and the preparatory gospel. That's what our scriptures teach. Okay, th there yeah. was there were some some interjections there of yes, Moses yes. and and I did that on purpose just to help there. people easily but, disagree with but me. Let me let me. Let no, me I think here. that's fair. I, I think what Jacob Isbell is trying to do is say, hey, look, just like you know th this happened in ancient Israel, um, I think what you're suggesting is the Melchizedek priesthood was taken away, but the well, according to the Lord. Uh, okay, <laughs> not um, my opinion. No, no, I, I get that, and the scriptures say okay, and the and the lesser scripture uh, priesthood continued, and so on and so forth. But that the story doesn't end there. Just like the story didn't end with uh, Moses throwing down the first set of tablets, he went up and he made another, and then he came back down, and the people recovenanted, and then there was another. It's like to assume that just because we have a scripture that the pride cycle went south once. To me, it would be ignorant of the rest of the whole story of the Book of Mormon where that pride cycle happened multiple times. I mean, the scriptures are replete with patience of the Lord saying, I it gather is. you like a hen gathers my chicks. So to say that like, okay, the priesthood was taken away once a doctor covenant since 84. Dude, I think the people post Nauvoo were under condemnation multiple times. And they yeah. went through that pride cycle 10 times. There's probably been 10 times he took away the power of the priesthood because well, we were me, acting poorly. It doesn't mean Russell M. Nelson's not a prophet. Or well, that the, let me the, the just, church let me just share. Let, yeah, let, let me just share. Um, here's how I view it. Wait, Jacob, before we keep yeah, going, go let's go back to Doctrine and Covenants 124. And yeah. let's go to the verses you didn't read. On okay. 51 I'll be nice, Brad. I, I've got it. No, I've got it right here. Let's go ahead and um, go I'll, to verses I'll fifty-one right here. to fifty-three. I, I mean, yeah. Let me let me hit this so everybody can see it. Doctor and Covenants, one twenty-four. Which verses? Okay, fifty-one. Yeah. Therefore, for this cause, I have I accepted the offerings of those whom I commanded to build up a city and a house under my name in Jackson County, Missouri, and were hindered. By their enemies, saith the Lord your God. Uh -huh. That's exactly the opposite of what you were just saying. Yeah. You're, you're trying to make the scripture sound like God didn't accept their offering because they didn't do it, because they didn't complete yeah. it. Well, this is, then, their, this is their opportunity to have this redeemed. In other words, the redemption of Zion is meant to redeem Jackson County, Missouri as well. According to this section that we're reading right here, Nauvoo is going to be a permanent stake of Zion as Jackson County, Missouri is redeemed, and the actual great and marvelous work kicks off and takes place it hasn't happened yet so let's 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 pull back from this for for just a second because the other thing we have to keep in mind here is uh, i i personally i'm not going to speak for everyone here but i tend to hold to an open theist point of view okay what is that so, uh, an open yeah theist, that was a pretty big word bro so uh, even for me man so an open, <laughs> an open theist recognizes that god interacts dynamically with the world as it is you'll notice that these blessings are conditional in other words, God could have said, just predicted the future, right? He could have just said, you will establish in Jackson County, Missouri, and this will happen. And many, in fact, many anti-Mormon types will say, look, he made prophecies that never came true because you guys were all supposed to be in Jackson County, Missouri, and now you guys are all in Salt Lake City. And so, you know, yeah. here is, here's the problem with that. We also are believers that these sorts of things are conditional because God interacts dynamically with human beings and he can actually change his plans. Okay, and that God can actually make adjustments based on what we do. Okay, that's the sort of the open theist concept. And it's the basic idea that if human beings have agency, then the future can never be perfectly known. 
because what we are going to do can never be perfectly known. Just it, philosophically. I, I think that principle is consistent with what we shared there. In other words, the more saying, definitely responds to when people this disobey. Is that, is that you're right. But what I'm saying is that actually goes to our point. There's nothing here to say that the, that the Lord could not have altered his plans because of what happened with all of us. Right? Because of the what we did. Yeah. Can I say it in just a simpler sentence, Jacob? I, I, I At least what I saw, and by the way, I mean Jacob Hansen. I hope you're talking I, to me. I'm interrupting <laughs> Jacob Hansen. So, uh, Jacob Isbell, I think what he's saying is, okay, you're right. They behaved badly, and the higher priesthood was taken away in Doctrine and Covenants 84. But I think what Brad is saying, when you step back and you keep reading the Doctrine and Covenants, you realize, okay, well, the Lord recognized they were hindered by their enemies, and they got it back. And then... Who knows? Maybe by Doctrine and Covenants section 297, once it's written, it'll be taken back, uh, taken away again, and we'll yeah. go through this pride cycle. The, the cyclical nature of the pride cycle, to me, yeah. is not a disqualification of modern prophets. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty excited for the great and marvelous work spoken about in the scriptures to kick off and take place. But I think there's going to be anybody who rests their foundation on whether President Nelson is a prophet, that's going to be dashed to pieces. It is only Jesus Christ. Any part of the foundation to where, because these men are in charge, Isn't it's that only Jesus Christ. the foundation that the church is teaching, though, that we should have our foundation on Christ? Uh, no, if you just read the baptismal interview questions, well, nobody's allowed to become a member of the church who isn't founded upon the brethren. Well, well, here's the thing. Well, because wait. Jesus Christ himself I, do I need to repeat said, that? Jesus Christ himself has said that if you reject his, ser- his servants, you reject yeah. him. And yeah, at Dr. the end of the day, here's, here's the other thing. We're not Protestants here. We never no. were. If you're just going to say, hey, all I need is Jesus, man, it's like, well, then there's plenty of Protestant groups that will agree with you. We actually believe in a priesthood hierarchy of authority that has been restored yeah. to the earth through the prophet Joseph Smith that exists. And if any group out there is not even claiming to hold the apostolic keys that Joseph Smith had, unless there's you plenty. even claim to have that, you just get disqualified from the start because you have no authority. Yeah, there's plenty of them, the different Orthodox churches, and they claim that we'll show you the receipts, look. Let's okay, have now, a sit-down, let's now, do a podcast. Now, now let me speak that. in defense of Jacob Isbell here, okay? is is I, I think both of you guys are saying something that's that's correct here. Um, yeah. Jacob Isbell, oh man, I have two Jacobs on one podcast. It's just <laughs> like, especially when you're both friends of mine, I want to like, Jacob, I got to call one of you Jake or something. But anyway, okay, so Jacob Isbell, I, I think your summary of the baptismal questions is... A little bit misrepresentative because the very first question is, do you have faith in and a testimony of yeah. Jesus Christ? Can I share a personal anecdote? Because I think well, yeah, but let me just finish. Then you get your personal anecdote. Yeah. I love anecdotes. But to say that you have to profess some kind of allegiance to the brethren to get baptized, I, I think is an exaggeration of um, the baptismal questions. At the same time, Jacob Hansen, yeah. I, I think you would be ignorant to the culture of the church not to say that in our excitement to show how we were different than other sects in the 20th century, our emphasis on modern prophets and the brethren resulted in a lot of people saying stupid stuff at church like, how can we be more in tune with the brethren instead of how can we be more in tune with the spirit? So so what I, I would like to just split it down the middle here and say, you know, Jacob Isbell is wrong that it's not doctrinal, but He's right that there's a cultural misinterpretation. Yeah. And, I'm, I'm fine with that. I think that's a good representation. And, of, and, of how I and so I don't think the official doctrine of the church is that you have to have a testimony of the brethren. I think the culture of the church, especially in Utah, where the church office building is much more prominent. Is, is, it, is it too much to say it's policy of the church? Yeah, that's too much to say. It's not official policy. Our culture is so much stronger than policy. I think they could shift the policy faster than they could the actual culture of the church. I, I think they're actively trying to. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think I, I think that's that's true. So anyway, next one we got like an, we got another five minutes, bro. You know what I'm saying? We got another five minutes. Hit it. It's, I do this kind of like home run derby. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of like Jacob Isbell throws a fastball and oh 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 that one got through. Oh, wait, next one comes. Boom. We hit that next batter up. So anyway, okay, keep going. Keep hitting it. So, is that it? Is that all you had, no, Jacob Isbell? Or you got no, 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 I'm, I'm happy to go with all of that. It's just a, but I do notice that we have a difference on what it means to be a prophet of God. And that's, and that's probably the main thing. Um, and let me just point out one detail on that. 
prophets of God that we have throughout the scriptures, especially the Book of Mormon and Old Testament, they are called from the outside when the religious religious establishment has been fully corrupt and leading are leading the people to destruction. I cite, for examples, in the days of Lehi and Jeremiah, the very first chapter of the Book of Mormon, the covenant people of God are convinced of their own righteousness. They're going to the temple every day. They're offering sacrifices. They can say, we keep the law of Moses, and yet... Those who are in charge of the temple and the synagogues are leading them to death, destruction, and enslavement. In the days of Jesus Christ, those who are in charge of the synagogues and the temple were leading the people to death, destruction, and enslavement. And Jesus came as a seeming outsider to that establishment. We are repeating the same thing today. I, I don't know, man. I, I When I look at the Book of Mormon and in Third Nephi, when you have the people of Nephi, they're doing what's right. They're in the right vein. And then when Jesus descends and comes to them, he still takes Nephi and baptizes him again. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. And so like he's still on the right path. He was still. There's a reason for that. Now, now what you're citing right there in third Nephi chapter 11, it's beautiful. That Nephi did so much with what he had, teaching people, raising his brother from the dead, having the miracles of God. And Jesus taught him a new order. And after Jesus taught him that order in 3 Nephi 11, it culminates in 3 Nephi chapter 19 to where they finally received the gift of the Holy Ghost and angels ministered to them. My call to people is to recognize being confirmed a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints does not give somebody the gift of the Holy Ghost. That is something that is an ordinance only performed by Jesus himself. And it will change somebody's life unmistakably so so yeah well i I was just gonna say that now you said two things here that i I actually think are 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 very true but we have to recognize a duality we just got done with a really interesting interview with terrell givens and well sorry nathaniel givens who wrote a book with his father terrell into the headwinds that says why belief has always been hard and still is and one of the things he brought up was hey you know first through third century early christians the difference between conversion and association, let me tell you, all the Christians were converted Christians. There wasn't just Christians that associated with Christians, because if you did, you might get fed to the, the lions in the Colosseum. Fast forward 2,000 years. when There's a lot of cost with membership. Yeah, yeah. Like, like fast forward 2,000 years uh, when the West has basically accepted Christianity as the state religion. You can't even run for president if you're not a Christian in America now. So there's very few converted Christians and a lot of affiliated Christians. So when I hear your criticisms of a lot of the problems with the church right now and the leadership of the church right now, I actually offer my unique experience with some of the higher ups in the church. I actually feel the brethren and the 12 get it and are much closer to God than that infernal church office building and all of the middle management (laughs) in between. And I can tell this to you. I know you're a stand for the brethren, uh, Jacob Hansen, and I'll let you, I'll let you, I'll let you, uh, you know, defend your boys here in a second, but I will just offer my unique experience. I have dealt with, for example, the temple department, dealing with the temple department as a, a, a body and an organization is a beautiful and lovely experience that I feel has just showed me, I I bet heaven kind of works that way. Dealing with the FM facilities management group that handles all the middle ground of the seminary buildings, the chapels and all their stuff. Can't stand it. Don't want to do it. Right. So, so when Jacob makes these criticisms of the church leadership, I think "Eh, what he's saying is more about the COB and the bureaucratic middle managers, less about the apostles and, and I, so I I'll, think, I'll just I'll just let you know that is not my take one bit. Oh, okay. Maybe I was being too benevolent and trying to. Split you, you, were, you were. You were. You were. Let me share my screen, and I and okay. I, I am going to make okay. a promise. This I'll, is my I'll last let, time, no matter what. I'll let last the brethren's time, biggest what? fan, Jacob Hansen, go <laughs> at you. Then, you know, in other words, when it, when it comes to the brethren, this is what influences me the most. Hopefully, I'm sharing my screen. Y'all are able to see it. Jesus Christ doesn't teach us to to study general conference talks or the words of the president of the church. Jesus Christ, the glorified, resurrected Jesus Christ says, a commandment I give you that you search these things, the words of Isaiah, diligently. For greater the words of Isaiah. And he specifies, Isaiah once spoke to the house of Israel, therefore he must speak to the Gentiles, which is us, including the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Because everything Isaiah said has been and shall be. Let me simply mean, what does the Lord mean when he says that? If the only thing you do is read Isaiah chapter 1, and ignore the rest of the Lord's commandment, if you just follow Jesus Christ enough to read Isaiah chapter 1, 
He says that the children of the Lord anciently and the Gentiles today have rejected the Lord. They are corruptors. They are children of corruptors, meaning it's been going on for generations. They have forsaken of the Lord. What does the Lord Jesus Christ say about church leadership today? The whole head is sick. The whole heart is faint. It's got bruises and wounds. And because the whole head and all of it is corrupt, your country is going to be less left desolate. The cities will be burned with fire. Strangers will come in and take the country and drive everybody out. I could do the whole chapter, but I won't do it right now. But I will point out, Jesus Christ declares that the covenant people of the latter days are in full-blown apostasy. That is, if you take his word seriously in the Book of Mormon. Oh, okay. Um, I don't think Russell M. Nelson's head is sick and his heart is faint, especially knowing that he actually runs well, up all of the church offices. You, you got steps. global lockdowns, <laughs> worldwide poison vaccinations by his This, this is a particular, the, the thing is, this is a particular interpretation that you have of those verses. Well, now, now, I would here, love to hear quick. it. Let me just give an imitation. Real, real Jacob, quick, real quick, real one quick, imitation. Okay. I promise I'll be quick. But Jacob, I would love to have long form as long as we want. You and I, let's just do Isaiah chapter one together. I would love that we podcast. Can, we can have that discussion. Here's what I want to point out here is a, is a bigger general principle. Okay. To, is that if there is not someone with keys on the earth today, then this is the best that I think we have. But the thing is, is that Christ says, O Jerusalem, thou which killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto, unto thee. How often would I have gathered thee to, or, Gather thy children together as a hen gathereth her brood under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left, or your house is left unto you desolate, and verily I say unto you, ye shall not see me until the time come when ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Christ also said of the apostles that he would call, he that receiveth you receiveth me. Yeah. Now, amen. amen. This, I'm in agreement. And the thing is, is that Christ, you are saying that Christ is not, like, if you don't have apostles or prophets on the earth today, well, then you're just back in the great apostasy once again, okay? I don't believe that the Lord yeah, has ever, the, I don't believe that the case has been made. I, I have a different definition of what it means to be a prophet. Well, well fine. Well, for example, if like you don't, the, the if commission. You don't think that, if you don't think that there is anyone on the earth today that holds the same keys as Peter and Paul and, 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 and the original apostles, that's fine. You can go and be a Protestant, and, and that's yeah, fine. Certainly not my position. But, that, that, yes, but what I'm saying is it's the logical conclusion of what yeah. happens if you reject yeah. the fact that there are indeed those who are called as Peter of yeah. old. Yeah. And so, well, and then what do you do? What do you do, Jacob, when like the Lord promises that the priesthood won't be taken again from the earth until you know Jesus Christ comes again at this, and this is the restored gospel? To say that the gospel that and the church that was restored through Joseph Smith has now failed without all the rest of the other prophecies being fulfilled would negate some of those prophecies in Scripture as well, yeah. would it not? Yeah. Uh, here's what I'm observing. There are thousands, and I'm, I'm guessing tens of thousands, maybe even more, generally within the church, who are waking up through the Spirit to recognize we are in the same circumstances described by Isaiah chapter 1. We are in the same circumstances described in the very first chapter of the Book of Mormon. We are being called to repent. The establishment will push the same policies as the World Economic Forum and the, uh, the establishment leadership, Russell M. Nelson, Alan H. Oaks, Henry B. Iring, for as long as they'll be around, they will push us closer to what's promoted right now by the globalists than what's taught by Jesus Christ. I don't think, I don't let me finish, think, let me finish this sentiment. I, well, well, I was going to say, let I me, don't let, think you're right, go but Uchtdorf was caught donating the maximum donation to yeah. Biden. I, the, yeah. I'm just saying. <laughs> that's I'm that's just, just no, a little just bit kidding. that we know. But in other words, individuals, what is happening right now is they're learning, hey, I personally have the same responsibility as Adam and Eve individually kicked out in the lone and dreary wilderness, and they have to call upon God, being willing to give whatever they need so that they will well, be returned to, to his Carden's, presence. To Cardin's point, though, you don't get to keep the baby and the bathwater in this case. If, in fact, the church has fallen and fallen yeah. all apart, that would just negate all of Joseph yeah. Smith. So you can't keep both. 
there's a question that I want to ask, and, and I don't want it to seem like a gotcha question because I've asked it before, but I do want to ask it in the right spirit. I really do mean this. I've asked this of my bishop and of my stake president, and I'd like to know how you feel. Is there anybody who is received into the kingdom of God today who does not believe that President Nelson is a prophet? Is there anyone? Oh, gosh, man, this is going to be a whole other podcast. I was about to end it right here. Um, the, the short answer is yes, there's going to be plenty um, because we know that there's going to be tons of people through the plan of happiness that learn truths in, in, uh, after they've died in spirit paradise and so on and so forth. There's probably tons of people that don't even know the name of Russell M. Nelson yeah. that we received into the Lord's uh, Abraham's bosom, as they say. So Let, let me ask just you, Cardin. Uh-huh. Can you be saved in the kingdom of, of God if you don't believe President Nelson is a prophet? I think once given all of the information that we'll have once we die and we're in spirit prison, uh, sorry, paradise, and we have the fullness of the understanding that we're promised through scripture, it will, will not be difficult for us to understand that even flawed prophets were prophets. So the short answer is yes. Okay. Can we stop now? Because I got another interview that we got to do really fast. You guys, you guys indulged me much more than you had to, but thank you. <laughs> okay. So, so, so Jacob Isbell, thank you for coming on. We do have to continue Plug the my conversation. Podcast. Plug it, plug it. Uh, how, I was going to say, how do people find you? How do they, how do they follow your stuff? Probably most common is Disciple of Christ is my channel on YouTube, and I respond to a whole bunch of messages, even in person. We have scripture studies and stuff like that. I freaking love it. And it is my prayer that all of us, all of us, all of us will be united in Christ. And thank you for having me. Hey, no sweat. Thank you for coming on, Jacob. Thanks, uh, Jacob. Yeah, see any other goodbyes? Okay, cool. Good. We're all good. All right, Jacob, thank you for coming. This is Midnight Mormons. We'll see you guys in the next program. Oh, 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 oh.